welcome everybody from every uh, few seconds just to say hello if they're joining and um, just remind them um, just to sort of familiarize themselves with the use of uh, Collaborate, uh, particularly with the chat as, um, as we'd like people to contribute to that. And just to say, well, I may as well say it, welcome everyone and uh, please, yeah, use the chat, um, introduce yourselves um, uh, to each other, maybe just say like uh, Imran has, uh, where you're from, maybe what your role is, and even what your interest is in this particular topic. Um, it'll be great to see um, the range of different uh, interests that people have. Thank you. Okay, Gemma, perhaps if we uh, need to start now. So, lots to get through today. I will uh, we'll crack on. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to today's um, Alt West Midlands webinar on uh, decolonising learning technologies. Uh, my name is Gemma Whitlin. Um, I'm an educational developer. I work in the College of Learning and Teaching at the University of Wolverhampton, and I'm also a member of the Alt West Mid Midlands um, Steering Group. And we're kind of hosting the event this afternoon. So um, my main job today is going to be to really to listen and to learn from uh, the wonderful speakers that we've got lined up for you. Um, but I'll also be keeping everybody to time. So you will see me popping up throughout the afternoon just to keep things ticking along. Um, me today as well is the chair of Alt West Midlands, John Cooperthwaite. Um, John has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to organise the event today along with um, our other West Midlands, Alt West Midlands colleagues. Uh, Professor John Traxler and Dr. Howard Scott. Um, huge thank you to them for bringing us all together today. Um, thanks also to our colleagues at Alt Headquarters who've supported us with this event, promoting and disseminating it through the Alt Network so that we can reach and collaborate with you all from far and wide. Um, so, you should see on your screens now the agenda for this afternoon's webinar. So after a brief welcome from me, I'll hand over to Professor John Traxler. He'll be offering some reflections on our first webinar that took place in the autumn. Um, we were really overwhelmed by the response to that first webinar and there were some fantastic things emerging and we're hoping to return to some of those today. We've then got two brilliant speakers lined up for you and if you were able to join us for the previous webinar then you may remember our speakers from their lightning talk. So we're absolutely thrilled to be able to invite them back today uh, to explore some ideas in some greater depth. So first up, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Sonia Stroden, Deputy Director of Academic Development and Research at the Centre for Learning Technologies at Stellenbosch University. Um, and she'll be exploring how critical di digital pedagogies of equity, diversity and inclusivity can be embedded in online curriculum. We'll then have uh, Dr. Kathleen Adam, Associate Manager of Open Development and Education. And she'll be talking about incorporating different ways of knowing and ways of being in course design through a reflection on new design of condition ideas and subject uh, Following the talks, um, Howard will be chairing a panel discussion with our speakers uh, before opening the floor for an open forum discussion. So have your mics and cameras at for later on when we will be expecting you to join in. Um, Howard will be returning to some of our emerging themes from today and from the last webinar. So I'm just going to share on my screen now some of the emerging themes that, that came out of our last webinar. We'll also be um, posting them into the chat just now as well. So I'd like to 
really just invite you, I think, to keep these questions at the forefront of your mind as we go through the afternoon. Sorry, Gemma, I don't think we can see your screen at the moment. I think we oh. lost it part way through, so you might just need to return to just a few of those visuals. Okay, bear with me. I think maybe John was getting himself set up and uh, <laughs> we lost the oh. share. It's easily yeah, done. How's that? Uh, not yet. Thinking about it. Here we go. There right. it is. This. Yeah, got it. Great. Thank you. All right. All right. So those those are those themes uh, that we'd like to um, kind of just and some questions to keep in your mind as we go through. We'll pop, I think Harry's going to pop those into the chat and come back to them later on. One tiny little bit of housekeeping. Everybody is a moderator at the moment. We've discovered as we've as come in to collaborate. So we just ask you to um, keep your cameras turned off for the majority of, of the events just to save bandwidth for others and to mute your microphones um, during the speakers. Um, however, we do encourage you to keep in and join, join in with us uh, by posting questions and comments in the chat. Myself and John will be keeping an eye on that throughout the afternoon and we'll get through as many questions as we can within the time we have. Um, anything that we can't get to, do, to today though, we will take away for consideration for our next event. Um, respond to any polls as they appear. Um, we'll also be recording today and a link for the recording and a copy of the slides will be made available to you after the event where we've got permission to share them. Uh, finally, I'd also like to encourage you to share your insights with the wider community and your network by using our hashtag, which is altwm underscore decolonise on all your social media posts. Um, so without further ado, I will stop my share and I'll um, hand over to you, John. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll start my share. Ah, has that worked? Perfect, John. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm, Okay, to some extent, I was just hoping to welcome everyone and to kind of recapitulate on the previous session. Um, and I guess the general experience was that what started as a innocent or naive question um, quickly snowballed into a large number of people from a variety of different roles and contexts wanting to join our first webinar and us feeling as though we were having a lot of trouble um, keeping hold of the tail of the tiger in some respects. This uh, um, and many people um, made offers to present at any subsequent events we might organise and obviously two of those are presenting today um, and that's partly in an attempt to do some justice to their earlier contributions in the first the first webinar. Um, in terms of recapitulating I suppose um, for me, it was useful to go back to the what seems to be enormous variety and complexity of definitions, which kind of embrace so many different dimensions of the challenge in front of us. Uh, this is maybe the most kind of global, um, but there are others from um, a newspaper that's published in Africa and the University of Kiel locally in the West Midlands that all have put a, a slightly different slant on it. And I think maybe because I'm concerned about what we say to our managers and our policymakers, I mean, the people that make a difference um, in the wider world, um, you know, what we say to them in, in order to make some change to um, effect some shift. And I think actually it's very um, good to remind ourselves that this is actually about an, enrich, uh, uh, an enrichment of the entire um, educational experience for all of the people inside formal education and indeed outside formal education if we have any any levers to press that might bring that about it's about making a far wider uh, and richer selection of experiences available through education um, and not merely about um, kind of remediation or, or remedy um, or representation uh, so I think I mean I think that's important in itself um, but it's also an important argument to make um, to people that actually have the capacity and the resources to make changes and make decisions and make a difference. Um, and when I say um, there are lots of different perspectives, these are just some of them. I mean, I suppose there is, for example, the legacy of 
um, if you like, Victorian uh, colonialism across parts of the global south versus the ongoing and current digital neo-colonialism of um, global digital corporations. There's then the, um, from a UK perspective or, or even a European perspective, um, the contrast um, and the difference between the experiences of colonialism overseas and the comparable experiences within, for example, the UK or the French or the Belgian perspective, where we see um, commun minority communities there um, that are still living with the legacies of colonialism in the countries where their forebears came from. I think it's also important to point out, I mean, maybe just because so much academic discourse happens in English or happens in American English, and that's part of a different problem, uh, worthwhile pointing out that actually this is not something that the English um, have been uniquely responsible for, but in the recent past we've had the, the Dutch, the French, the Belgian, the Spanish and the Portuguese, but also um, uh, Russian Soviet Tsarist um, colonialism and imperialism and the same with um, Ottoman expansion and Arabic expansion in its time. So this is not um, something in one language or, or the subject of one system, but actually it's far more pervasive um, and widespread. And also we see, I suppose, a kind of microcosm of that in relation to indigenous communities within um, our own, meaning um, UK, British or European, indigenous communities within them, the Basque, the, the Breton, the Sami and others, um, and the Roma, the gypsies, travellers, and indeed refugees, uh, compared to indigenous communities within the white settler nations, you know, for example, the um, the Cree in America, in Canada, uh, any number of communities in um, the USA, and so on. So it's, I'm just basically pointing out the, the kind of enormity and the complexity and the different perspectives on this issue, um, and the extent to which it raises questions about. How can you, I suppose, how can you decolonize educational technology or ed tech without worrying about the curriculum um, in which it's delivered, the theories of learning and pedagogy and teaching that underpin it, uh, the research that underpins the theories uh, and the, the tools of that research, uh, the techniques, but also then the way in which research is funded, um, the way in which research professionals operate within that research and funding environment, the way in which research projects around ed tech are then managed and governed, uh, and then the research ethics when we engage with communities unlike our own. I mean, sorry, when, and when I say unlike our own, unlike the, um, the white majority. Um, so partly it's, it, it becomes part of a much, much wider issue of which decolonizing education and then the university or the university sector, the school sector, the education sector, they all form uh, a part. Um, and before I just raised um, some questions about education technology specifically uh, and the extent to which just day in, day out, every which way with every which application or service or operating system, we're kind of bombarded with um, terminology, gestures, um, icons, emojis and so on, chosen for us, um, basically from a white Western culture uh, and quite possibly oppressive or meaningless uh, to any other culture uh, and how that might have started with textual interaction back in the days of MS-DOS, but now superseded by a lot of graphical um, interaction with um, well, what were called WIMP interfaces, which I think was Windows, it, I can't remember what the I stands for, mice and pointers anyway, to, to possibly to cultures for whom Windows and mice might be completely meaningless. And I think that's actually just superficial in many respects, and we can think about kind of scraping off all of those, um, but I rather suspect that will just reveal a deeper level uh, of the problem uh, down through, I don't know, the languages, the operating systems, the peripherals and so on. I mean, the keyboard is one example. Um, but then specifically, we, we, in terms of educational technology, we very quickly reach the technologies that seem to be front and centre in, in terms of much of what we do, the virtual learning environment um, or learn and management system, Canvas, Moodle, WebCT, uh, and, and being forced to ask to what extent those actually just embody Western pedagogies. 
and, and although sorry, I've travelled in Russia and I've travelled in the Middle East and seen educators there trying to, as it were, appropriate um, those systems, um, and it can be done. I mean, you can use um, WebCT in Russia in an entirely different and very didactic lecture-based format, um, and you can do something similar in Palestine and Gaza. But you know, they are quite conscious that what they're doing is trying to overwrite what was implicit and embodied in the systems they're using. Um, yeah, so I think it's very difficult to think about decolonizing educational technology without asking about the pedagogies and the theories um, that get transformed into the practice of educational technology. And I think it's also part of a, the same um, comprehensive um, holistic system um, when we ask how is how is all of that supported by funding um, how does the funding how is the funding skewed and biased how does publication the profession dissemination the process of, of review how does all of that operate in um, and how does all of that um, reinforce the, um, the kind of colonialism we find elsewhere in the education system um, and so part of those questions about research methods is partly asking to what extent are the research methods we use interviews and focus groups basically European and pre-digital and, and how do we go about devising other research methods and this is to some extent a nod to a, an ongoing project um, that I'm involved with uh, with Sri Futring and Margarita Cool and Matt Smith looking at the different aspects of many of this uh, many of these uh, many of these concerns but it just reveals how complex it is when you start dealing with so many diverse communities that are so so different from the established norm within the UK university sector um, so that was a kind of recapitulation of, of where we were at the end of the last session or maybe at the middle of the last session since then I've had the opportunity to read quite a lot and try to write quite a lot um, and just become very conscious of um, the complexity and the confusion, the amount that's being published, the amount of thinking that's being done, and how the issue is not just something that we can ever localise on educational technology. It seems to be systemic and pervasive. Um, it's kind of about hearts and minds as well as about nuts and bolts. At, at a personal level, I was very concerned and still am um, uh, about white male privilege. And I don't know how I personally address that apart from owning up to it and hoping that whatever we do empowers other people to take our places if we are part of the white hegemony um, and I'm quoting Taskeen I think that must have been I thought it was from an email but, uh, but maybe she copied it somewhere else as well yeah that the, the university sector is, is um, dominated by uh, colonial modes of thinking how do we do something about it uh, and my practical concern, as opposed to, if you like, my personal concern, was how do we talk to our managers and policy makers? How do we recognise the kind of languages and values they speak and hear? And how do we move them from where they are? In fact, how do we ma manage to help them recognise where they are? Um, how do we manage to move them um, in, in directions they can see the value of? Oh. Um, Perfect timing, John. <laughs> Sorry? Perfect timing, John. I was just about to give you a one minute warning. <laughs> extra, That's the wonders of Britain. Yeah, extra bonus points for you today. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure there are, are lots of questions coming in. And what we will do is we'll save those for, um, for the panel later on. Um, and then uh, we'll move straight on to our first speaker, which is um, Sonia. Sonia, are you uh, are you ready? Um, yes, uh, Gemma. Thank you so much. If you don't mind just sharing sharing my slides, that that would be fantastic. We'll share the screen with you. Let me know if you can see it. There we go. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great. Um, Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your time for the very kind introduction as well and of course also the, the invitation. 
Um, as 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 Gemma said, um, she'll uh, she'll obviously also direct the slides today for me as well. And Gemma, I'm going to start with the second slide, please. The next slide. Uh, maybe in starting with with a whole conversation, and maybe I'm presenting what I'm sharing today as a as a case study, and and therefore I've positioned it against the university that I work at at this stage. But I also think it's important to also highlight my own positionality uh, situated within these debates and contemplations that John so eloquently outlined for us uh, in the beginning of the session. I studied and I currently work at a historically advantaged institution in South Africa, which has reached on many levels of, of capital. So obviously that has an influence uh, also in the specific lens that I use when, when I try to make sense of, of these complex concepts. And, and maybe um, also what, what, what is important here is, is maybe also, also to acknowledge that, that there are many aspects, as John highlighted there, that, that one could focus on. In my case specifically is my interest in, in pedagogy uh, within, under, under this broader umbrella of decolonization of educational technology. So I would like to start by sharing how the process, and that would mean the engagement with critical digital pedagogy specifically, how it started at our institution. Um, and I'll start off by, by referring back to, to the pandemic. Um, much has been said about the pandemic, pandemic pedagogy, its associated facets, and the impact on our current views of education and teaching and learning. But maybe this quote on the screen is for me something that that actually um, lingered uh, in, uh, some lingering questions that I had the whole time, albeit perhaps not always as eloquent conceptualized, that I carried with me during the pandemic and also instigated this whole process of, of, of engagement with critical digital pedagogy. Maybe just very briefly, uh, can there be such a thing as excellent teaching in a challenging world in which the threat of disease and necessity of social distancing socially warrant a pedagogy, pedagogy designed by separation, which is obviously a pandemic uh, focus. But then the second part, can educators rationalize the growth of distance learning while also retaining the intimacy that lies at the heart of social justice praxis? Gemma, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, while keeping this quote in mind, um, let me just very briefly outline how our center, the Center for Learning Technologies, and the broader division for learning and teaching enhancement at our institution started to reflect on our own practices during the pandemic. We realized during the pandemic that there was a great need for care and humanizing pedagogies within the online space. Uh, and although at that stage that our focus primarily foc uh, was embedded, not embedded in critical theory, it provided us with a platform to actually to start to explore our own pedagogical practices within this so-called forced uh, time of online engagement. And based on our reflections, our division uh, uh, wrote a book uh, about our own personal experiences, but specifically focusing on humanizing pedagogies and then also the ethics of care. Now, as we started to further explore these concepts, it became clear that we wanted and needed to move beyond the surface approaches. And I think that's what I'm trying to get at in terms of acknowledging the human within the online space, but also to delve deeper and further in terms of humanizing pedagogies and what it truly represents in our understanding. And that led us to further engagement with the work of starting off with the work of Paula Freire, and then obviously also, also other critical theorists. Uh, Gemma, just the next slide, please. Of course, in order for us to be able to situate our work, we need to acknowledge also where we come from. And also in this broader South African context, um, all our institutions had to grapple with many processes um, during the time of the pandemic and also how to move forward in terms of the online specifically um, but once again, what, what was exacerbated specifically in our case as well was also the plight of our students uh, in our institution, but most certainly also in other higher education institutions in South Africa and beyond the continent as well. And I'll share with you some of these challenges on, on this slide here. Once again, uh, we don't have time to go through all of these, but in terms of the South African context, obviously, um, it is clear that we have very much complex and interrelated socioeconomic, historical and personal injustices that we're still trying to, to address. 
to focus on the student, you also see there that, and it, it speaks to, to what John also earlier said, that um, in our case, very often funding is available for many of our marginalized students, but even if they have that funding, they struggle to meet the entry requirements of historically advantaged institutions, such as the institution that I work at. Very often, they don't have access to cultural capital, so they're born into poverty. And then, of course, obviously, very often, the knowledge of these students, what they bring to our education, is very obvious, uh, uh, often also not acknowledged in the higher education context. So those are just some of the aspects that we need to grapple with from a South African perspective. Also from a broader continental perspective, um, Jenna, if we could just move on, please. There are also some, some uh, aspects that, that we need to take into consideration. For instance, you'll see the first part of that slide I've highlighted, the renewed interest in blended learning. Now, be it, of course, it's, it's nothing new or revolutionary, it once again places emphasis on the potential and the possible way in which these modes of provision and pedagogical orientations could assist previously disadvantaged institutions to catch up with other higher education institutions. And I've given you some, some examples there as well. Um, as we all know, it's not as simple as that, uh, as highlighted also in the first part of those slides. Uh, we have challenges with increased transactional distance, very often in terms of our contextual responsiveness, we tend to have a very light touch or a one-size-fits-all approach, which is obviously going against to what, what we try to explore in terms of critical digital pedagogies. But then, of course, is also developing in parallel was, was also this whole idea of, of the, the conversations and the hopes in terms of increased automation of the African content, uh, continent. Um, and I've, I've made reference there to AI and education specifically, um, and, and the hopes in terms of inclusivity, personalization, students being able to, to actually choose their different pathways. But then to me, a point of, of, of concern is at the bottom of that slide, and something that, that also speaks to social justice and critical digital pedagogy, that very often these types of concepts, uh, specifically artificial intelligence in learning, very, very often lacks uh, uh, paying attention to political, psychological, or even philosophical aspects of learning that, that is so crucial and so important. So colleagues, let's quickly have a look at, at the way, the practical way in which we try to, 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 to actually unpack the notion of critical digital pedagogy. So, so Gemma, if we can go to the next slide, please. Right, it's, it seems if the image is not loading there, and uh, no, just the previous slide, you know, sorry, it seems if that image is not working there. I'll, so I'll quickly say something about that. Uh, to me, one of the key challenges of, uh, in our field specifically is bridging the gap between theory and then also praxis. To theorize, but also then to acknowledge actually uh, and further develop the practical applications of the digital teaching and learning practices. Uh, at this stage, in terms of the theoretical, uh, our work is rooted in the work of, of Paulo Freire. Um, but then on the other hand, and that's an that's a, a, a image that I'll share with you a bit later on, which should be on the right hand side, is also our search of a translation device uh, that could assist us in understanding the alignment between theory and practice. And I would like to draw on the work of Ty and Rukoma specifically there. They provided a conceptual framework that was rooted in three pillars. And the one pillar is basically looking at our pedagogical orientation. So that means it's actually the way in which we believe uh, teaching and learning takes place. So in our case, that would be critical digital pedagogies. And then the second pillar is actually our pedagogical practices, those things, the actions. And I'll refer to some of these practices a bit later on. And, but then the third pillar is adding on our digital competencies. Uh, so it brings the digital into that conversation as well. So based on, on what I've shared now, for, for me, it, it becomes a constant challenge to actually bridge that gap between our theorizing, understanding the theory, but then translating it, of course, via translation, uh, translation device or conceptual framework to practice. And how do, we, how do we then actually do something about that in our different contexts? 
Jim, if we can go to the next slide, please. There we go. Thank you. So where are we at present in our quest to untangle and to unpack the notion of critical digital pedagogy? Perhaps it starts uh, with an acknowledgement of the complex entanglement of theory, principles and practices as being suggested by the social material perspective, for those of you who are familiar with that. This perspective actually uh, believes that there's a, a relational ontology or worldview that argues for equal status uh, in terms of the human and the non-human. Now, equal status in our context, and in this webinar, of course, then will be between individuals, students and lecturers, but then also the digital. The digital is therefore not secondary, but actually remains imperative in our educational relationship. Now, in my mind, uh, this perspective could serve as a possible pathway in acknowledging the entanglements and the interactions of both human and non-human entities in our attempt to actually clarify and foreground critical digital pedagogy. Jim, if we can go to the next slide, please. But yet, once again, the question is, how does this translate into practice? Now, Freire focused mainly on the disciplinary content. Well, I could, it could be argued that we would need to move to a deeper level of engagement with so-called micro processes as well. And with it beyond the micro processes, it's implied that lecturers need to become interested and involved in the development of relationships with, uh, in the classroom and how power plays out in the learning environment. Some of those concepts that we are really touching on in terms of our conversations, in terms of decolonization of educational technology. Dialogue could be viewed as a way of understanding how to apply critical digital pedagogy by focusing on the communication between lecturers and then also students. Uh, in the view of Freire, it is argued firstly that we need to establish a type of a horizontal relationship that is rooted in trust between lecturer and, and between then students before we can actually attempt to address external transformational issues as well. And perhaps one of the possible ways forward, a practical way forward, is to once again to start to consider the role of digital technology affordances in the quest of embedding a culture of mutual dialogue in the online classroom. Often the focus remains on the material affordances of a tool, what we can or cannot achieve given a particular cohort or learning outcomes and so forth. But perhaps it becomes necessary again to, to refocus uh, on the close alignment between the tool, in other words, the material, but then also the intention, and in this case, then the pedagogical approach. Jenna, just the next slide, please. Another way forward, and this is what I would like to propose in addition to, to the work of Paula Freire, is also to consider affect in, in this whole process. Um, increasingly, affect and emotion are foregrounded as important constituents of interdisciplinary uh, narratives. Um, perhaps what is relevant to ask is not only in the digital space, uh, how does affect or then emotions relate to loss, pain or guilt, and how does that impact us as lecturers, but then most certainly and more importantly also then as students as well. Uh, I would love to make an argument that we need to consider the entanglement then between affect and pedagogy, and that is a critical consideration in order for us to delve deeper into these micro actions and the, the different levels of pedagogical engagement. In a way, uh, it urges lectures to move away from the embedded constructivist notion of learning towards uh, a more nuanced understanding uh, of the interconnectivity and the dynamic nature of the cognition, affects, and then also the essential simulations and simulations of, of, of what we experience. The question is therefore not just contemplating what we feel in particular situations, but also why we feel what we feel. And once again, thinking from the philosophical, from the theory, bringing it back down into the practical side of things, 
uh, Anwar Rudin, uh, very interesting, provides us with some pedagogical considerations when we start to allow affect into the classroom. As expected, of course, we, we focus on the design of learning activities, that's, that's essential. But more importantly also, it is that lecturers could start to consider activities that, that illustrate how emotion developed and are instituted in, in the lived experience of students. Uh, and it comes back to that first slide that I shared with you with the South African context as well, specifically, but globally as well, the types of knowledge also that students bring to, to the higher education institution as well. It's not, it's not also the acknowledgement of affect that, that is important, of course, but also the historical journey of affect. In other words, the history that preceded the emotions displayed in the classroom. And for me, this is a crucial element uh, that, that one could add to our conversations in terms of pedagogical uh, engagement and, and rethinking the notion of pedagogy within the digital classroom, but most certainly and more importantly, under the umbrella of social justice, uh, equity, diversity, and then of course, inclusivity as well. A follow-up question would have obviously be then, how do we translate this in terms of pedagogical, activi pedagogical activities? Uh, how do we go about in designing uh, learning activities that actually address some of these issues that I've just highlighted as well? Colleagues, for me to, to conclude, uh, it's, it's my last slide, uh, Gemma, if we can move on to that slide, please. Um, many, many aspects that I've very briefly touched on uh, during this session, touched on the notion of dialogue, uh, aspects such as power relations, which, which I didn't really uh, unpack. And then, of course, the role of affect uh, that could start the process of understanding critical digital pedagogies. I would like to underline the importance of acknowledging the complexity of, of human nature also in relation with, with the digital. And it speaks to what John also earlier said, the, it's such a multifaceted construct, the, the decolonization of, of educational technology. And maybe I would like to conclude with the quote that, that we have on the screen here by Professor Aslan Fattah, who is, is an a honorary professor at, at Stellenbosch University. He argues here that the person is alive, multiple, doubling, mimicking, shadowing, shifting, breathing, surviving, inhabiting cracks and adopting bodily ta tactics. The core of his or her existence is thinking, intellectualizing, working adaptively, creatively, with knowledges, with language, literacies, tools, resources, and so forth. Metaphorically, the type of university that this author favours is when knowledge and its manifestation in the light of the complex systemic, sociological and cosmological complexities of our humanness remains a search to become fully human in this world. And our search as educationists, as lecturers, academic developers, and then also of students is then also in terms of critical digital pedagogies how do we bring that aspect of humaneness into, into our conversations? So colleagues, it's, it's in a nutshell what, what my, my thoughts at this stage. And as I say, this is, a, this is a, pro, a developmental process. Most certainly we don't have all the answers at this stage. And, and most certainly there are different aspects that would need to be further explored. But this is where we are from an institutional perspective at this stage in terms of un uncovering the notion of, of critical digital pedagogies. So thank you so much for your attention and for your time. Fabulous. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks ever so much for that um, really excellent presentation. Um, I, was, I was really interested in what you were saying around dialogue and how important that is for the process. And I think, I think as educators, that's, that's really something engaging in that dialogue with our tutors with our other colleagues with our students um is, is really really crucial and really key um so fantastic there's lots of rounds of applause coming in for you on the uh, on the chat as well um if you've got any questions for sonia 
Um, if you could pop those into the chat for us now, or if you prefer to um, kind of stick your hand up, use the hand raise button at the bottom of your screen, then you can also do it that way. Lots of appreciation going on there. Right, so there's a lot to digest in your presentation. There was a really interesting um, comment um, early on in your talk about um, cultural capital and, and how difficult it can be to separate that from coloniality. I don't know whether you've got any thoughts on that to add, Sonia or, or Bethany, um, who the comment came from as well. Maybe Bethany first? Yes, please, Sonia. I think from, from my side, uh, perhaps, Jim, it is, uh, you know, that's that's why it was important from my side to actually also highlight my own positionality in this whole process. Uh, and, and I wanted to highlight the fact that, that I work at an institution that, and we use the term historically advantaged institutions in South Africa, or historically disadvantaged institutions based on obviously the apartheid era, etc. Um, and that, that plays a role in terms of, of also capital that we have access to, of course, and, and the way in which we had to reflect, and, and I'll use the pandemic as, as maybe the instigator, once again, we um, I contributed to a paper by, uh, by Maura Czernovich and colleagues in 2020, where we reflected on, on the, the different experiences of higher education institutions in South Africa specifically, and it was so clear that continuum of, of different levels of capital and access that we have in an institution and obviously then also at, at the deeper dimension then of course in terms of our students that, that attend these universities as well and one cannot make the assumption the fact that a student who is attending a, a previously advantaged institution that it necessarily advantaged them at that point in time. Many of our students come from rural areas, come from communities where there is an absolutely different, different way of of experience cultural norms and, and then having to um, a cult, the whole notion of acculturation into a previously advantaged institution is also something that I think that we need to be cognizant of as well. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we've got a question in from Michael in the chat. Uh, Michael Kay, how, how do you think we can measure whether an effect Effective turn in a digital classroom has been successful. What does success look like? Michael, I was afraid for a question like that in terms of measuring success, because obviously I think that is that's that's one of the challenges in terms of of, of all of these philosophical orientations um, as well. Um, to be honest with you, um, for, for me, I think it is such a um, subjective experience. The moment when you bring emotion or affect into the classroom, it becomes really difficult to, to move outside and, and become objective in our experiences in terms of that. So, so maybe in terms of success or the way in which we could measure it or look at the implications, it would, uh, I would suggest that we draw on, on these notions also of, of our research methodologies uh, that, that we would most probably also need to reconsider alternative approaches of trying to uncover the way in which we think something is happening and, and what we define as success then as well. So it could be methodologies that we need to re rethink, but then also very importantly is to, to rethink what, what we define as success in terms of affect specifically, which is completely personal and then also subjective. Super, thanks. I hope that answers your, your question, Michael. If, you, if you'd like to add anything by turning on your, your mic or your camera, then you'd be most welcome. And we've had another comment in from Kate. Um, thank you, Sonia, really for thought provoking. Um, it's been my experience that some academics feel very threatened by these ideas because it relates directly to how they understand their role, and uh, do you have any recommendations about how we might tackle this? 
I think it's a very it's a very in, important comment, uh, Kate, that that you're making in terms of um, teaching academics and us working with students. And I think it's it's a very much a, a conceptual uh, move, a paradigm shift that that would need to take place, and that that happens over time. It's not something that that you do it one way the one day, and then the other day it's, it's something different. The way in which we need to think about building relationships of trust, of trust between ourselves and with our students as well. It's only then, uh, in, in my experience, that, that we could start to actually further explore these aspects such as dialogue, uh, etc. And the reality of it is, of course, that in larger cohorts, in larger groups, these, type of, uh, these types of uh, contemplations and ideas will be much harder to, to implement, of course. Um, if I think about the post-grad group, a smaller group, um, that, that's perhaps easier, in a sense, to, to start to build these ideas of trust, mutual vulnerability, uh, you know, that those aspects of, of humanizing pedagogies, creating opportunities for, for dialogue, being aware, willing to learn from each other, um, inviting new types of knowledge into the classroom as well, not me only being the, the expert. So all of these things are, are aspects that I think are challenging and also questions the conventional and the traditional way of how many of us were trained and educated as well as whether it's uh, academics, scholars or whatever we identify with. Um, so, so for me, I think it's, uh, in my mind, it's starting small, also with a smaller group perhaps, and start to build our own confidence in, in terms of that as well. I hope that answer, answers your question, Kate. Thank you. We have one more quick question um, from John R, number two. Um, <laughs> how do we develop opportunities for staff to reflect on their identity and their practice leading to change slash EDI in the classroom and wider university. How do we develop opportunities to start with um, John, thank you for that question. I think um, in my mind, and obviously I work in the, the, um, the field of, of uh, academic development, I think it's, 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 a, it's an opportunity uh, or we need to create safe spaces We we as staff members, whether we are teaching staff, whether we are professional support staff, it doesn't really matter, that, that we can start to uncover um, and, and engage in conversations of, of our own positionality and our own identity within these different spaces. I think it's only when we start with that particularly reflecting on, on ourselves as individuals, that we'll be able to translate that into our own practice. And only if we're comfortable with that, probably that would translate into the classroom as well. But probably in my mind, uh, uh, a possible way of, of, of starting this process would be once again, smaller groups, uh, groupings of, of, of staff members, and that we start to very slowly start to uncover these different experiences and identities that, that we bring to the conversation as well. Excellent. Thanks ever so much. Well, we'll hear more from you uh, later on in the panel, but now we're going we're kind to of move on to our second speaker, which is uh, Tasteen. Are you ready to go? Hi, everyone. Yes, can you see my screen fine? Yes, absolutely. Great. Um, all right, thank you everyone. Um, so I'm Dr. Tasteen Adam. Um, and yeah, I've just completed, well, a, a few years ago, completed my PhD looking at addressing injustices in MOOCs. So today I'm going to be presenting a little bit from, from that research, one specific chapter uh, that focuses on incorporating different ways of knowing and different ways of being into course design. Um, so I'm, I'm from two different organizations. One is Open Development and Education, and uh, we focus on the use of evidence, uh, equitable and open practices to make effective change in education in low and middle income countries. And I also work with the EdTech Hub, which goal is to empower people by giving them the evidence that they need uh, to use um, technology 
in education. So before I actually kick off, um, I also want to acknowledge my positionality and, and, and I want to do it intentionally because I don't think that positionality is just for white people to do. Um, positionality is something about intersectionality. And so although I'm a, a brown Muslim South African woman, um, I also had the opportunity of studying at the University of Cambridge. And to be quite honest, that has developed my cultural capital. And I don't think I would have been here today if I didn't have those networks and connections. Um, I also want to thank Sonia because the point that she left off with was a perfect segue for my presentation today, which draws on these concepts of um, emotion and aliveness and, and humanness in critical pedagogy. Um, so to jump straight in, um, the context of my research was the Fees Must Fall and Rose Must Fall movements in South Africa. And as Sonia highlighted, South Africa is shaded with a, a historical injustices over time that has led it to be one of the most unequal countries in the world. However, those inequalities, although colonialism um, and apartheid officially ended, those inequalities are still present um, in the material injustices and epistemic injustices that um, are evident in university spaces currently. The other side of my research then looks at the global online MOOC movement. So MOOC stand for Massive Open Online Courses. And um, many South African MOOCs joined this, this global movement um, around 2014, 2013. And um, this is when online education was still quite innovative and niche. Um, but then COVID hit and online education became uh, a much more common and, and mainstream uh, way of, of teaching and learning. And this pivot online exacerbated inequality. So that's sort of the background of my research. Um, so in my presentation today, I'm going to be using uh, a few key terms. I thought I'd just explain them. So MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. The definition of this has really shifted over time to somewhat meaning like it doesn't really have a solid definition. But broadly understanding, MOOCs are online courses that cater to thousands or hundreds of thousands of students from a broad range of countries. And originally, it was quite informal, supplementary learning. But MOOCs have shifted to become more certified and accredited um, for diplomas, for example. There's always been this tension around what open means in a MOOC uh, because a lot of MOOCs didn't have content that was reusable and remixable, which are the, the fundamental tenets of what open means. And today I'm going to be talking about MOOC designers, so the people who create this. Um, and this can mean the MOOC facilitator or the instructor, instructor but also the tech support and, and the whole team that supports that process. Um, and while I'm going to be talking about MOOCs, the, the lessons that I share are quite relevant um, across all online and hybrid course teaching and actually quite relevant to in-person teaching as well. Because although MOOCs cater to a global audience, there's also diversity within the classroom uh, in face-to-face -face teaching and learning that we often don't acknowledge when it's much more obvious when you're looking at a global um, class. The next thing I'm going to focus on is open educational practices. And this looks at the shift from open educational resources to practices, uh, which shifts away from just creating and reusing resources, but in for using um, academic practice, such as blogging or tweeting or presenting or, or pedagogic activities, such as critical pedagogy, uh, to promote reflection, reusability, and collaboration. Uh, the next two terms that I touch on, embodiment and epistemology, um, actually, these two terms were in the title of my original, uh, the original title I sent to the team organizing, uh, and they told me it was too overwhelming. So the next two terms are actually going to be what I'm going to be talking about and explaining in detail um, throughout um, this presentation today. But, but just quickly, epistemology refers to different theories of knowledge and knowing. So this is how we come to determine what is knowledge in the first place. Now, um, in my PhD, I researched and looked at a lot of different frameworks, from social justice frameworks to decoloniality. And um, a lot of 
the what I read uh, um, was sometimes conflicting or different or complementary. And so what I did in my PhD was first develop this conceptual framework, and it drew in social justice theories that are often rooted from global North understandings of what justice means, and then decolonial theories, which often were rooted from global South and merged together this dimensions of human injustice. Um, so the three dimensions are material injustices, um, and these focuses on addressing the causes of resource, infrastructural, geographical and socioeconomic inequalities that stem from human hierarchies. Then you get political and geopolitical injustices that address international and national relations of power that reproduce racial, uh, class, sexual, gender, geographic, spiritual, and linguistic hierarchies. And cultural epistemic injustices, which is what the, the rest of my presentation is going to be focusing on today, looks at addressing dominant conceptions of knowledge and the way that uh, this can exclude differing histories, values, narratives, um, and worldviews. So in my research, I examined whose knowledges and what knowledges are forefronted in MOOCs. And this presentation today is concerned mainly with a lack of epistemic diversity and plurality through the productions of MOOCs. So just to give you a few examples, 89% of English repositories of OER come from Europe and North America, and only 1% comes from Africa. And within the MOOC sphere, uh, only 1.7 and 1.1% of MOOC producers are Black on Coursera and FutureLearn, respectively. But like, why, why does this matter, right? So for me, the reason this matters is that the lack of diversity in MOOC designers or course designers shows a lack of epistemological diversity. And what does this mean? Um, this relates to the different ways of knowing and the meaning making and different processes in which we construct what knowledge is. And this is based on our embodied, distributed and situated cognition um, of the people who generate this knowledge. So the design and the development of MOOCs is strongly connected to who produces the MOOCs, what their identities are, what their lived experiences are, what teaching philosophies and pedagogies they use. And for the rest of the presentation, this I'm going to talk about this through the concept of embodiment. So to go through my flow of argument today, uh, through this theory of embodiment, I'm going to shift thinking of MOOC designers from simply enactors of OER or open educational practices to embodiments of in openness in themselves. And this is because in my research, I asked MOOC designers how they enact openness in their design. And I got a variety of different responses based on people's identities and subjectivities. So that's the process I used. I examined the ways in which these MOOC designers enact openness in their design um, based on their shaping of what openness means. And the main finding was that MOOC designers create MOOCs that strongly link to who they are, what they value, and how they understand the world, just as most teaching and learning does. It goes through the teacher as a vehicle. And from this, my call to action is that I argue that MOOC designers from epistemically diverse backgrounds are necessary to counter the dominance of the Western-centric epistemologies that are evident in, in MOOCs. And the goal here for me is not just representation. It's not just about having a color spectrum um, on a MOOC uh, producer board, but it's actually to prevent um, uh, a digital epistemicide. And I, I define this digital epistemicide as a systematic uh, suppression of marginalized knowledges through digital means. And I'll expand on that a bit more. Um, so to just take you through some of my research questions, there were two angles to it. The philosophical question, which was, uh, what impact does this embodied, distributed, and situated cognition of MOOC designers have on the epistemological foundations of, uh, of MOOCs? And then also exploring the relationship between MOOC designers and their praxis of openness. So to what extent do MOOC designers enact openness in their design based on their reasoning of what openness means to them? And this was all part of my bigger thesis, um, which looked at, in, uh, look, looked at um, investigating the considerations that MOOC designers, when they 
used in creating their MOOCs and to see how this, whether this matches the needs of the majority of marginalized youth in South Africa. So I'm going to take you through three uh, or oh, four actually different um, sources that I drew on to understand what embodiment means. So the first one is from cognitive science uh, sciences. And here Johnson challenges the idea of this rigid separation between the mind and the body, cog cognition and emotion, reason and imagination, and instead argues that they're inextricably linked with memory, emotion, languages, and lived experiences. Um, this is also the idea of a second nature, uh, and particularly the argument that human beings acquire their cognitive capacities by initiation through language and tradition. Um, and this is based on not just our lived experiences, not just who we are today, but on cu cumulative cultural evolution, so the history of our cultures. Um, and then this environment has a history. So history um, owes its form to the activities of human beings, which are then conditioned into the development of the mind. So it's the cycle between history and in, in, in informing culture, which informs uh, the history of that culture. Now, um, in cognitive sciences, although they talked about the concept of embodiment, it was somehow talked about a bit neutrally or apolitically. But embodiment also features in decolonial thought. And in decolonial thought, Gross Vogel talks about this, saying, uh, we always speak from a particular location in power structures. No one can escape class, sexual, gender, spiritual, linguistic, geographical, and racial hi hierarchies uh, of the modern colonial and capitalist patriarchal world system. And the main point here is a locus of enunci enunciation. So this is the, the geopolitical and the body political location in which someone speaks from. And this is never disembodied from, uh, um, from where they are speaking. So it's, it's never unlocated and neutral. Um, the idea of objectivity is in myth. Now, Grosswogel also points out the difference between um, being socially located, so being physically in a spe specific place, and um, have being located epist epistemically in a location. This is an epistemic location. And uh, the reason he highlights this is because it was precisely the, the project of the model, modern colonial world system to make subjects that are socially located on the oppressed side of colonial difference to think epistemically like the ones on the dominant side. So you might have someone who is maybe positioned in South Africa, but that doesn't mean that they're speaking from a South African view. They could have adopted uh, more oppressive dominant positions um, because we're taught to aspire to that. Um, the next thing is critical pedagogy, drawing on our previous presenter's work, Sonia. So um, critical pedagogy involves constantly developing this idea of a critical consciousness, right? Um, which is about learning to perceive social, political, and economic contradictions um, and take actions to address these oppressive elements in reality. Now, there's one aspect in critical pedagogy, which is called critical reflexivity. And this, this concept talked about by Dorr um, recognizes the embodied nature of practitioners, um, of the practitioner's response to the world. And Dorr argues that educational practice cannot be se separated from the essential nature of the practitioner. That's continuous reflective critique of the sociocultural world and the external impositions on oneself is needed by the practitioner. So note that my argument is not that, oh, if you come from um, a place of privilege or power, you're no longer allowed to speak or you shouldn't be presenting or talking. The idea here is to become critically reflexive of your position um, and to see how you can shift powers and how you can give up your powers to support others. Um, the last one I wanted to talk about was embodiment in pre-Islamic pre uh, pedagogy. So here I wanted to draw on the person in the picture called Mirabitul al-Hajj. Um, Mirabitul al-Hajj um, al is a Mauritanian Islamic scholar who, to me, represents pre-modern Islamic pedagogy. 
here teachers and students from around the world, from Western institutions, institutions as well, come and travel to the rural parts of Mauritania um, and studied under his guidance when he was alive. Now, the epistemological foundations of this pedagogy are completely different to what we no normally understand. Um, for example, students would just silently be in the presence of this teacher, or they would follow him around doing his daily activities. Um, and th this was counted as valuable learning. And this is because one was spiritually blessed by his presence. Um, here, the connection between the student and the teacher isn't one of the mind, it's one of the heart and of the soul. And the teacher is not seen as the, the source of knowledge or the facilitator of this knowledge, but the embodiment of the knowledge, right? So when, when we learn about this, it's, it, it's like the teacher, the, who the teacher is in character is more valuable than the content that they are teaching. So it's really about him embodying what he talks about. Um, and when you sit with him, um, it might be that he's actually more knowledgeable than the source of knowledge in a book. So he might actually correct you on that. Um, so the reason I also want to bring this up is because um, of this idea of adverse incorporation. When we bring things onto the digital online space, um, how, how would you, how on earth would you bring this type of pedagogy into uh, a digital online space of openness? So it's really also looking at when and how things can't actually, where local and indigenous knowledges can't be brought in to this virtual way of teaching and learning. Now, um, kind of moving on to the findings and, and the more practical stuff in my research is looking at the different ways that the MOOC designers that I interviewed embodied openness based on different aspects of their character or their identities or their lived experiences. So I'm going to take you quickly through four of these. So their personal background, their race, religion, gender, location, and heritage, professional backgrounds, which fields they were from, life experiences, whatever privileges or hardships they dealt with, and political um, inclinations. I have many examples, but today I've just chosen a few. So the first one is um, openness through respecting different cultures. So Nena says, I think because it is such a visual thing, and she's talking about MOOCs here, uh, you need to pay attention to the visual. So in my culture, you find that a woman who is married covers her hair. So for some segments of this MOOC, I covered my hair because I had to portray that I'm a married woman and a married woman from my place covers her hair. Um, because, and the reason she did this is because when you reach to another audience that feels yes, she understands what she is and, and, and how she's doing this. So Nene accommodates for culture in two ways. First, she takes into account the role that the visual and the body plays in making uh, these online videos for MOOCs. And she recognizes that the participants, the target audience that she wants to reach, prefers for a woman to cover her hair with, a, uh, with um, a head wrap. And she accommodates for this by making these cultural preferences. Secondly, she is a married woman from that culture. And covering her hair gives her respect and authority because she's respecting the traditional practices. And this is quite interesting because and the second point, um, it's also something that has to do with her being this black African female. For example, if she was a European white lady, the same expectations might not be put on her. So understanding that who she is really impacts uh, how she needs to be presented in this. The next one is about openness in terms of ac academic background. And here we have um, Anna, who is an anthropologist, and she emphasizes this idea um, of history and um, how, um, sorry, she says, very few of MOOCs have been co-created with anybody from the South. So she's very focused on, on people and the geopolitics. Um, it's unidirectional, it's not very interactive, and some of them, uh, but, uh, sorry, uh, but the majority of them were just like, here, here's this wonderful MIT stuff, please use it. So the idea is a sort of unidirectional transfer that she acknowledges um, as lacking openness because of this. 
uh, Francois, who's a mathematics teacher, looks at openness as um, a public license in Creative Commons. Ahmed, who is a, a philosophy teacher, um, talks about pedagogy and critical pedagogy again, where students can articulate their voices, where they come to speak and where students speak their minds. Just the way he speaks is so philosophical. Um, and then we have Victor, who's from Academic Supports, and he says, um, our job is to improve access to those who are disadvantaged. So the MOOC is based very much on, on that, in that we deal with issues of identity, um, language, culture, and identity. Um, and David, who is in health sciences, merges this with the idea of rural health and this whole um, ability to access health services. And he looks at openness through that paradigm. Um, so there's a strong correlation between the MOOC designers' profession and the understanding of what openness means. Um, so that's finding the, that one that one's profession interrelates with, with their worldview um, is critical to highlight, but why is this critical to highlight, right? So when, when you have MOOC designers and support teams that are of one background, let's say a bunch of marketers come together to make a course, um, they don't get input from other disciplines. And that means that their understanding of openness and perspectives in the course can be limited. So it's really important to, to bring disciplines and have a transdisciplinary approach. Um, the next one is political influences. And so Anna, who comes from a Marxist background, talks about uh, the decontextualization of things and how knowledge um, uh, and history is really important in, in understanding openness and different perspectives. Um, Francois, who um, comes from a more left-wing thought, talks about social justice. Um, but he also talks about the idea that um, I don't think that supplying online courses could remotely replace the inequalities we have in, in the school system in South Africa. We still have apartheid. So for him, he's focusing a lot on material injustices. Um, and then lastly, um, we, uh, the last quote says, so, uh, and the last person is from uh, the fees must fall movement. And so he says, okay, so while you're interested in more of these IT aspects of who can access and who can't, um, before we talk about access, we need to talk about disturbance and resistance of the status quo. So um, for him, before MOOCs can address issues of access, power imbalances need to be addressed first. Now, just shifting a bit. You are at 20 minutes or just over now, so if you've got um, okay. opportunity to wrap let up. Me, all right, let me skip over these last few slides and just move on to my summary. So. Um, MOOC, the, the idea of this whole presentation was that MOOC designers create MOOCs that strongly link to who they are, what they value, and how they understand the world. And openness is understood and implemented differently by MOOC, MOOC designers based on their locations, histories, subjective, subjectivities, personality, character. Um, and and this, is, this is what I've termed embodiment. So as the way in which one in which openness is understood impacts the way that one um, creates a MOOC, um, it's really important to incorporate the di diversity and difference of, of MOOC designers. So MOOC designers from different cultures, value systems, and epistemologies. And diversity does not just mean inclusion through assimilation and homogenization of cultures into one, but truly embracing difference, differences um, in ways of knowing and ways of being and so in conclusion i think my presentation has has presented these contested views from the margins and broadened conventional understandings of openness um, that have shaped dominant epistemologies and for me it's the fear if there's one take-home message it's the fear of digital uh, of a digital epistemicide so failing to include these different ways of knowing uh, amplifies this concern uh, where only the dominant European epistemologies survive due to open practices that fail to include different voices um, from the per periphery. And this one last thing to note is that um, this entire research was premised on this conceptualizing of embodiment through lived and body bodily experiences. But 
there's an entire field of embodiment that also focuses on the physical and the kinesthetic um, aspects of learning through movement and gaze and touch and, and talk, speech, all of this together. Um, and these are things that still can't be represented through teaching and learning through an online medium. Um, and so that's something for us to think about that as we shift online, what ways of learning and knowing and being um, uh, are being eradicated. Um, thank you. Sorry for going over time. No, that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Chastine. That's wonderful. Uh, we are going to move quite quickly to uh, the panel because we've got about 15 minutes left before the end. Uh, but I will just highlight there was a really fascinating question from Sean about other modes of learning, such as um, storytelling or spoken word being incorporated into the virtual realm with the same respect as other established modal learning methods. I don't know whether you've got a quick comment on that before we move to Howard and the panel. Okay, can you just repeat that again, please? I didn't get the question. Uh, it's, it's about different uh, modes of learning, such as storytelling and spoken word in the virtual yeah. world. Yes, yes, yes. And I think those are definitely uh, important to incorporate. I have a whole other presentation, which I can put in the link, that talks about um, these different practical approaches uh, to decolonizing learning design. And I can share that as well. That sounds excellent. Thanks so much. Yes, please do share. Um, so now I'm going to um, hand over to the next item on our agenda, um, which is our panel discussion with Sonia Taskeen, John Traxler, and it will be expertly um, chaired by um, Howard Scott. Uh, so we've got about 15 minutes left for this, um, Howard, if that's all right with you. Right, not sure if you can hear me or see me. Um, <clears throat> Uh, well, where to start? That's um, you know we've already got a range of, of um, very challenging questions, and I think um, that's the important thing. We're all here to learn, and I would say that um, such important research challenges us to um, be uncomfortable um, and force us to think about things in a different way, um, especially those of us in positions of privilege. I'd start with, um, if I might, just start with some of the questions that were sent to us as discussion points. And I think there's one that really stands out. Um, these were provided by Sonia and Taskeen. And Sonia asks, um, so I put this to those on the panel, but everybody in attendance as well. And I'll actually put it into the chat, in fact. But the question is from Sonia, and it's which dimensions of critical digital pedagogy do we see as important in bringing the two worlds together, the two worlds of uh, um, equality and diversity and inclusion and rapid developments in technology? Any thoughts? Um. I'm happy to jump in first. Please. Oh, I think I think for me it's it's what I presented on in terms of the concept of reflexivity, critical reflexivity, um, because that is that allows for people to share the power in a room. So critical respect reflexivity is even put puts the teacher um, at a point where the the learners can question and challenge them because you're learning from from the collective rather than being the source of knowledge in a classroom. So I think that idea is, comes across as strong for me. Great. Thank you. Yeah, John? I, I think I, yeah, sorry, John. Um, I think I agree with Daskinia's well in terms of being a teacher or teaching academic is, is that willingness to, as I said previously, to uh, critically reflect, of course, but but then to take that forward uh, is is the next step. The the learnings, what what we've learned about ourselves, what we've learned about uh, our, our own positionality within this teaching learning assessment environment that that we live in uh, and work in as well, um, and how that translates then to to the way in which we engage with our students in order to start to build that. That, that relationship of trust, uh, mutual vulnerability, mutual respect, et cetera, et cetera. 
and I think sorry I'd agree with all of that and my concern is actually a worry about um, the extent to which we as teachers are partly constrained by the culture of our students but obviously also the culture and the regulations um, of our institutions and possibly the way in which they reflect uh, wider society societal constraints and in some senses that harks back to my my earlier concern about how do we make this make sense to the people that um, manage our institutions that's interesting I um, was thinking before about this word autotelic um, which uh, I can't pronounce the name I'm afraid uh, an Eastern European right so I'll post it in the chat but he um, talks about the autotelic purpose of using technology as being in the West very kind of almost selfish like it has its own reward I think you're on mute John if you Oh, sorry. So, um, in terms of how that relates to the conversation, um, our pedagogies are somehow very, very kind of, you know, it's about the individual. It's and it reflects the kind of individualism of the West, and the you know everything is done for the self, perhaps rather than the community um, that we might see, and that kind of, um, you know, problem problem solving or knowledge sharing in order to solve problems um or doing things for their own sake um is somehow redolent of this okay well any other points from the um participants otherwise i'll go back to the questions well partly sorry even when you say sorry now i can't say it or oh, no sorry forget it uh, yes i mean i i um, I don't want to sound anti-academic, and in fact, uh, I mean, certainly amongst several and many other people, I love reading what Taskeen writes, um, and, and it's quite intoxicating, um, uh, if you see what I mean. Um, but then worry about how that, how some of our discussions can both distance us from colleagues in other disciplines, where you know decolonialism, if you like, needs to happen just as much as it does in our disciplines. Um, uh, and again, how it creates a distance again, sorry, I keep coming back to this a distance between us uh, and our managers or our politicians or our um, institutions. Uh, and I think we need, I mean, maybe it's just a, an ongoing concern about, about academia, you know, the, the, the extent to which we're really good at talking to each other and not so good at talking to anyone else. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work to be done translating this into the, if you like, the value systems. I mean, it's a bit about means and ends, uh, the value systems of other communities that have influence on what we do. Hmm. Um, I think just to build on what John said, I think it's also important to know that decolonial movements started in the political arena and only have recently come into the academic space. I mean, decolonization was, was a very political act and within the South African history, within the last uh, decade, the this movement started from students on the ground protesting, right? Yes, it didn't okay, start sorry, in I, textbooks. I, I, so, so yeah. understanding that it actually started in the real world and now has become academicized <laughs> and sort of coined in terms of you know famous authors that we would cite, but actually it is real lived experiences of people. And I agree that we need to take it back to those students who who speak from a collective voice rather than individual academic voices. I think that remark kind of plays both ways because you're absolutely correct in saying it comes from um, political movement amongst students. But that would have been, for example, the case in South Africa or in Oxford um, in the UK. Uh, and maybe we ought to think about the mechanisms by which we exploit other such public manifestations of uh, colonialism. I'm thinking about the kind of repatriations movement of, of artists, of artifacts, you know, and maybe we ought to be saying, yeah, but there's a resonance here with um, educational technology, if you like, or or the um, reparations movement um, rising in the Caribbean and saying, yeah, there's a resonance here with educational technology. Can you see that, you know, the outside world is trying to tell us something? Any response? Because uh, 
we're a little short of time. I'd like to bring in the discussion point from Taskeen. It relates as well. Um, it was the discussion point you sent in advance, and I've um, done the European thing of um, perhaps twisting your words into a question because you said it wasn't. You weren't sure that it was a question that we'd asked for. So I hope this reflects um, the point that you made, and. I think it fits with what we're talking about again, um, bringing it back to technology as well. But my, my thinking when I was listening was somehow that you know technologies are advancing at such a fast rate um, as they always do, and you know policy doesn't keep up with them, um, regulation doesn't keep up with them if it should. Um, so how do we be proactive rather than reactive in designing um, in to new spaces, um, some of the principles. And I think this is kind of what you're driving at here as well, with, about the decision-making being more inclusive. The questions in the chat panel. Yeah. Sorry, I've now gone off at a tangent and, and slightly worry about the way in which we're happily talking about educational technology. And I guess that means technology is devoted to education within the formal education system uh, systems uh, and could quite easily neglect the extent to which people use their own technologies to um, generate ideas and discussion and opinions and images and information. You know, thinking about what happens in social media, you know, which is kind of learning, but not as we know it or not as we choose to recognize it within an academic context. And actually that all of that is built on platforms like, I don't know, Google, Google Scholar, uh, YouTube, you know, the artificial intelligence underneath those things, um, you know, and the list is quite long and the li literature is, is becoming larger about how all of those systems are skewed in one direction and not in another, you know, and how they perpetuate all sorts of um, implicit and or unconscious biases. So I kind of worry that, um, you know, educational technology within the education sector might be kind of moving the deck chairs around on the on the Titanic. Uh, although, admittedly, when Taskeen talks about MOOCs, that that's a kind of bridge across from the formal to the informal. But I still worry about the, you know, the extent to which those more pervasive um, digital systems are embodying the, the the challenge we're trying to meet. Sonia Taskeen. I just building off what John said, I think um, that I, I like the point you raised also about social media in terms of way, ways in which tools or ed tech can be used as tools for subversion. So how can you get the, the, the marginalized voices to be heard? And we've seen many a times like movements like Black Lives Matter and others have used technologies as tools for emancipation. So um, it's almost like shifting and like, like looking at uh, um, how algorithms or um, things can can um, you know be racist, but then on the other side, if we can use them correctly, we can also use them to um, fight for justice as well. Yeah, I, I agree with 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 both comments here. Um, I think it's um, it's very often, uh, and perhaps that's. The easy way in for me in terms of rather than exploring pedagogical approaches as a pro as opposed to asking these lot uh, this very important broader question in terms of the design of, of technology etc what we have then um, how can we use it to the benefit of our students of to, to the way of creating new knowledge of opening up uh, crossing boundaries um, the way in which we decide how to use these tools, and that's why I also refer to, to the affordances of tools again. Uh, something, a concept that we've been using for ages, but to, to really bring it into alignment with clearly demarcated and decided on pedagogical approaches and having an end goal in mind with that, by not only merely using it for the sake of it, but, but then also to address some of these issues, as you've rightly mentioned, uh, Taskin as well. Um, just to pick up on something John um, has offered uh, in the chat panel about the 
perhaps the need for global representation in designing new technologies. We have web standards in some areas, but most the uncertainty about how to build for a broad audience of users. I think that's a good point. You know, the the need for digital literacy is perhaps not based on the kind of affordances that we understand in the um, global north or west that are suited to our cultures, but um, affordances that reflect local contexts, perhaps. Fabulous. Excellent. Well, I'm sorry to jump in. I'm sure we could all listen to you all um, speak all day. And um, please, everybody, do show your appreciation for our panel in whichever way you choose. Um, a huge thank you to you all, everyone. Uh, Tasky, Sonia, John, and uh, our expert cha chair, um, Howard. Um, just to wrap up today's event, I'd just like to take a moment just to think about our next um, here, so hopefully a slide should just be popping up for you now. Um, clearly, there's a lot more work to do, um, lots more things to explore. Um, and here at Alt West Midlands, we are planning to hold a third event in the series. Um, we have a proposed date of the 29th of June, which is a Wednesday. It will be at the same time as today's event, um, wherever in the world you are. Um, we're hoping to have more of a virtual workshop type focus. Um, for the next event, and um, we tentatively have a couple of speakers lined up. Um, we'd like to explore the more practical side of, of this. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, we would like to um, invite expressions of interest from anyone who is interested in contributing to the event um, or potentially hosting the next event. So please do drop an email to us um, and we'll pop some contact details in the chat for you. And also do look out for the booking information once everything's confirmed. Um, I'm just going to uh, also um, do a quick reminder, Alt C 22 and the call for proposals is now open. So if you've got something that you would like to submit for the Alt C conference, that's the 6th to the 8th of September at, in Manchester. And the deadline for submission is the 31st of May. So uh, you've got a, a few days left to, to pop something in today if you, if you so desire. Um, John. John Cooper, right? You've been very quiet today. Is there anything that you would like to add before we wrap up? Uh, nothing, nothing more to add. No, I was just uh, searching for some emails to add them to the chat to give some uh, contacts details for everyone if they want to uh, share some uh, uh, contributions for the next session. Um, I just want to, uh, as chair of this group, just to say a huge thank you to to our speakers. Uh, they've done a wonderful job today. Great. Uh, presentations and discussions uh, and to John and to Gemma as well and Howard uh, for, for hosting such a wonderful session so thank you everyone uh, really really pleased uh, with this and uh, look forward to the next session so uh, if anybody want, does want to contribute do reach out to myself I think I emailed lots of people the other day it's just uh, John Cooperthwaite at gmail.com um, or to John Trax so there, there's his email address as well so there's no hiding for any of us um, please uh, do offer something. We'd love to get as many people involved as possible. And this was very much the third session when myself and John talked about this probably about almost a year ago now, um, all about the practical next steps. Um, so we've heard about sort of the issues and how different people are thinking about things, but we want to now sort of look to see how as a group uh, we might be able to work together or identify materials that are already starting to solve some of these problems. John, do you want to say just a final word or two? No, no, I'm happy to leave it as a, an unfinal word in the sense that there seems to be so much going on and opportunities to, um, to, to pursue it in all sorts of different directions. I just think kind of the, the more the better. And I'm um, learning loads um, and happy to carry on with that. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Look forward to seeing you again on the 29th of June. Look forward to seeing lots of emails with offers of contributions. Um, have a great uh, few months and uh, thank you again. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.